is a leader in the Black Lives Matter movement. Please welcome DeRay McKesson. Thanks for coming back. It's good to be back. Last time we talked was uh, in the fall. Yes. You were here. And there was already um, a lot of attention being played to, uh, to paid to Black Lives Matter and about the racial uh, attention in the United States. But the last few weeks have been um, a terrible for race relations in the United States. That is true. Um, you yourself were actually arrested in Baton Rouge. During a protest, um, uh, what do you think is happening right now? Uh, do you think anything positive can come from such a terrible situation? Yes. Yeah, so when I think about protests, I think of it as this idea of telling the truth in public. And what we've been doing with our bodies is telling the truth that Philando, Alton, so many people should still be alive. Mm -hmm. And what's powerful is that these conversations, I hope, are leading to better conversations about solutions. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the protests in Baton Rouge, we think about, you know, I didn't plan to get arrested, uh, but so many people got arrested that really brought attention to the crisis with the Baton Rouge Police Department. You didn't plan to get arrested, but it really does look art directed. You know, that it just, is, it just, that is you even know, well lit. You know, okay. it was this moment of, uh, you know, I had a moment where it was like, if I resist arrest, it'll be a real problem. Mm -hmm. So I just had to find this moment of peace and just say, like, I'm okay with it and I'm just going to go. Um, but again, I think that all of this is about forcing a conversation in public about race and racism that people have just been afraid to have. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that we can create space for us to talk about solutions. I think about that with the meeting with Obama earlier this week that we had uh, and so many other conversations that The president had. had a meeting at the White House yeah. with uh, various community leaders and leaders from both law enforcement and from uh, civil rights and civil justice organizations like yourself. Yep. What was that meeting like? What did you guys talk about? And so we met with the president for about four and a half hours. It was one of the longest meetings of his presidency. Uh, and we talked really about solutions. So President Obama pushed people not to just talk about what the problems were in uh, the slice of the world that they represented, but to really think about what solutions. So we talked about things like uh, using federal government money as a way to incentivize or hold police departments accountable differently. We talked about police union contracts and in the fact that in this country there's a shadow justice system for police and police have to be held accountable for their work but we also got to hear uh, from police chiefs about why they think the work is hard in a different way and i must say over the last 22 months i've not been in many rooms with uh, police chiefs from around the country and while we don't always agree about solutions it was actually interesting to hear them uh, and i do think that the space was productive but we know that just being in the room in and of itself doesn't change things mm -hmm. uh, so i'm hopeful that this will lead to concrete things and, and uh, loretta lynch was there and the the president, in his speech at the, at the memorial service, yep. um, he said that it's important to walk in each other's shoes, okay? Uh, you know, I, I, I understand that I can't understand the position of Black Lives Matter fully because I'm not a black man, and I haven't been pulled over repeatedly by the police. But can you understand that you may not understand the position of what a policeman your age might be going through if they come to what they perceive as possibly a dangerous situation and don't know what to do? Have you, has it opened your eyes at all to what, what their fears and, and what their motivations might be that aren't necessarily racist? Yeah, so we can accept that policing is hard. We can accept that people want to wake up every day and they want to go home alive. Like, mm -hmm. we, we accept those things. But when I think about the medical profession, right, I've not been a doctor, but I have expectations about how doctors function. Mm -hmm. I've not been a policeman, but I have expectations that they don't kill people as a condition of their job. Like, we believe that, you know? And I think that that is... Well, when somebody says to you, the vast majority of police don't do that, what is your reaction? Yeah. This is about a culture that's broken. Mm -hmm. And we know that the culture of policing has to change so the communities are safe again. Mm -hmm. And we think about the death of Philando, we think about Alton, and so many other people, mm -hmm. Rakia, Maya. And that speaks to a culture that's broken. So, yeah, there are a lot of police officers who have not kill people. There are also a lot of police officers who continue to participate in a system where the culture is broken. And we need those police officers to step up and say they know that the system has to change. And again, in the meeting with Obama, I will say uh, the police chiefs did note that there needs to be some change. And we had a conversation about solutions. And I think that's productive. Well, let's talk about Dallas for a second and the tragedy and the horror that happened there. It was during a, a, a march. It was after. It was protests. People, protests. Were, people were still in the streets. Yes, you can't protests. say it's over till everybody's gone home, man. I'm not saying it's associated, okay. but I'm saying that this person um, 
particularly targeted police, specifically white police, at least that's what he said to the negotiators on the phone with him. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a decentralized movement. While you are a leader of the Black Lives Matter movement, there is not a singular organization. Correct. Do you bear any responsibility for having a central organization that can have a, co a cohesive message so people cannot misinterpret what you're doing as a call for violence or reprisals against the police? Because while this may be a deranged individual, there have been, we've heard recordings of people chanting for violence against the police in marches. What's your responsibility as a leader of this movement to keep that from happening? So two things. First is that there are incredible leaders all across the country. So there are so many people stepping up and for the first time for some people having their voices being heard and learning how to organize and that is powerful mm -hmm. so the decentralized nature is actually i think a strength of the movement not a weakness of the movement the second thing when we think about dallas is that the movement has always been rooted in a call to end violence that was true 10 days ago it's true five days ago it's true today and it'll be true tomorrow so when we think about dallas it is a tragedy and my condolences go out to the victims of all violence uh, but that, had, that, that was not related to the movement. So I think the decentralized nature, again, is a strength of the movement, and there's so many incredible people leading all across the country. We, we've got to go, but one, one last thing is that I understand the president said that you're too hard on the police in your rhetoric. Do you understand what he meant by that? No, I think that his general push was that we should all try and see each other's perspectives differently. And again, we are hard on the police because we believe that the police, we can live in a world where the police don't kill people. Like, that's a fundamental belief. And we'll continue saying that in streets, in board meetings, uh, to you, and so many other people until it changes. Well, I hope we see you again. DeRay, thank you for being thank here. You.